Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this study today. We thank you because of your spirit that is ever abiding, ever present with us to lead us into the depth of the truth of the revelation of the Lord. Therefore, Lord, as we come today, we realize our nothingness. We realize that on our own, we cannot intelligently understand your word because there is a natural blindness or scale upon the spiritual sight of all people except your spirit will take the scales away. Therefore, Lord, we are pleading with you that as we come into your presence today, wanting to learn from you, we pray that all the scales of ignorance and darkness will be removed away from us in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we do not want to be like those people in uh, Hebrews where we are told that they were dull of hearing. Always learning, they did not come to the absolute knowledge of the truth. Always learning, but then we're told in Timothy that they did not really know and they did not walk in the way of the Lord. Father, we pray that you will take all ignorance, all lethargy, all lukewarmness away from every one of us in Jesus' name. So that the study of your word will benefit us tremendously. Lord, we come to this important study today, this important chapter today, and we do not want to miss what you have for us. Therefore, Lord, we pray that you will gird us, you will surround us, build the edge around us, that the devil will not be able to distract our attention as we look into the word in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, we pray that you help us to behold wonderfully great things in your word today in Jesus' name. Shed the light on your word. Throw light on our darkened understanding that we, by your grace and enablement, may walk in the way of the Lord like you are teaching us. Bring us into a closer relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we come to an important chapter in the book of Exodus. We're looking at Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through to 25. For you to get a feel of what the chapter has, I'm going to read some selected verses to you. Open your Bible as we read together. In Exodus chapter 19 from verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called out, called him out of the mountain saying, This thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now in verse 10, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people. And sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. In verse 18, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Those verses will make you to understand the lessons the Lord wants to teach us here. There is so much in this chapter. The title we have for the chapter is The Awe-Inspiring Presence of God at Sinai. God had brought the children of Israel to Mount Sinai. 
In fact, this is exactly as God had promised when Moses first met the Lord at the burning bush. He told him at that time that certainly I will be with thee. And then he told him that this shall be a sign unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve or worship God upon this mountain. It is at that very site now we see the children of Israel. It shows us very clearly that God's promises will not fail, can never fail. If we follow God faithfully, God is able to fulfill his word and is able to bring us to the promised destination. You will see that in the case of Moses and Israel, there was on their way Pharaoh's unbelief, the magician's opposition, and the perplexing problems among the people. And yet, through it all, and in it all, all those things could not change the faithfulness of God. We are told that they really came to the mount at this time. This reminds us very clearly now that in our lives too, the Lord is able to perform all his good word that he had given unto us in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. In the face of all the opposition, in the face of all the rejection and the unbelief, yet the counsel of the Lord stood. It teaches us that God's power is great enough to support his word and to fulfill his promise. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not a judge or a title shall pass from the law until everything be fulfilled. We are assured in the word of God that God is not a man that he should lie. In fact, we are told in Titus chapter 1 verse 2 that God cannot lie. The question I have for you then is, why should we ever doubt the Lord or doubt the word of the Lord? You should make up your mind that the world cannot make me doubt the Lord. I know that his word is true. Now Israel was led to a solemn covenant with the Lord. I just read it to you in some of those verses now. Before the awe-inspiring presence of the Lord, they came into this wonderful covenant with the Lord. In fact, the Lord called them to become a peculiar treasure unto him. Israel had earlier seen the irresistible power of God in Egypt and also at the Red Sea. But in no other place had they been made to behold the fearful, awesome majesty of the Almighty God. Before receiving the law of God, which we'll find in the next chapter, chapter 20, they were made to tremble before the great judge of heaven and earth. Now, you want to see that this appears to have been a pattern with the Almighty God. That is this majestic revelation of the awe-inspiring reverence or presence or glory of God before giving them the law. Let me just remind you that before hearing the voice and the call of God, Moses beheld a strange sight, that of the burning bush where it was not consumed. Not only that, Israel. At the time of Samuel, had the terrifying sound of the thunder before realizing the wickedness of their hearts. Do you remember the case of Elijah? On the mount before the Lord, he saw the great wind and the earthquake and the fire before hearing God's still small voice. That's what you'll find. And this is what God is doing here. He wanted them to behold the greatness of his majesty, the might of his power. He wanted them to see that our God is a fearful, a terrifying God, a great and a mighty God, before he will reveal the law unto them. Is that limited to the Old Testament? No, not at all. If you come on to the New Testament, here is what you realize. There came a day when three of Christ's disciples saw his glory and majesty on a mount of transfiguration before they could see the confirmation of Christ's teaching as not a cunningly devised fable. That's what Peter later told us. He said when they saw that, in fact, he said they beheld his majesty, convincing them, making them to know that all they were following was not cunningly devised fable. Do you remember Paul the Apostle, that great teacher, an apostle of the Gentiles? He was knocked down 
by God Christ's mighty power and glory before receiving the commission which later he could never compromise, he could never doubt. First of all, the awesome majesty or presence of God and then the revelation of the call, the commission and the commandment of the Lord. In the case of John, the beloved, the apostle, he saw the majesty of Christ. In fact, he said, when he saw that majesty of the Lord, that left him prostrate on the ground before he received the final message and prophecy for the church. Why did God do that? And why does God sometimes do that? It is so that those who know the greatness of the God of heaven will not, will never treat his word lightly. So the Lord appeared to the children of Israel in this place, in this awe-inspiring presence, majestic, terrifying power of God, so that as they will receive the law uh, in the following chapter, they will honor that law, they will fear that God, they will respect and receive the law of the Lord completely. Now let us go to the details of the chapter. I've divided the chapter to three parts. Number one, solemn covenant to be a peculiar treasure isn't that what you need to know in your life that will know how to come into a solemn covenant with the lord so that we can become god's peculiar treasure we'll talk more about that later number two holiness and discipline in the congregation if the church is going to be sound if the church is going to be on, in, on the right solid ground that the Lord expects the church to be, those are two things we must not be ignorant about. Holiness and discipline in the congregation. And then number three, majestic presence of God upon the mount. Majestic presence of God upon the mount. Let's go back to point number one. Solemn covenant to be a peculiar treasure we're looking at verses 1 through to verse 9 part by part exodus chapter 19 from verse 1 in the third month when the children of israel were gone forth out of the land of egypt the same day came they into the wilderness of sinai for they were departed from rephidim and were come to the desert of sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now here we see that the Lord fulfilled his word, as I told you before. God brought Israel to the wilderness of Sinai. To be encamped before the mount in fulfillment of his word. To Moses at the burning bush. God had assured Moses that he will bring the people to worship him even at that mount. And so it was. It gives us confidence before the Lord that we can always trust God to fulfill his word. You want to understand that this area before the mountain was large enough to accommodate a large number of people. And there they camped, and there the Lord spoke with them, and made a solemn covenant with them. And through that, through divine power, Israel had been snatched from the usurper and brought to the bosom of the Lord. Now Israel, as a result of what the Lord had done for them, they were now to come into this solemn covenant with the Lord. Verse 4, ye have seen what i did unto the egyptians and how i bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself before the lord told them the conditions of the covenant he first of all told them what good he had done for them before telling them of the commandment and of the necessity of obedience he first of all related related to them the gift he had given them the power he had manifested on their behalf the care he had taken concerning them, the provision he had made for them. You see, that is what God always does. He does something for us, then he says, on the basis of what I've done for you, why don't you come into this covenant relationship with me? We can look back at the time we were saved. And we can even look back beyond that and look at Calvary and see the great price the Lord has paid concerning our soul. 
And because of his great love, because of the great gift, because of the great sacrifice, because of that great price, and because of the peace and the salvation we enjoy, and because of the promise of heaven, the Lord now says, see all that I've done for you. And then after that, he brings us into a covenant relationship with himself. Now, what the Lord said here, when he said, ye have seen how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. In fact, this was so important that Moses repeated it at a later time. To show these children of Israel the great manifestation of power and care and grace concerning them. In Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Verses 11 and 12. As an eagle stirreth up a nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them and beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. Here Moses related once again how God brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And then he makes use of the vivid picture, illustration of the eagle training the young ones to fly and taking care of those eaglets, those little ones. And it says, this eagle will stir up the nest and then will flutter over the young and it will spread the wings abroad to take those eaglets on the wings and then he'll bear those uh, little ones the very great height and then it says it is that's an illustration of how the lord did lead the children of israel bearing them to the top of the mountain bearing them across the sea over the mountains and over all the difficulties and problems they came through and this is what the Lord is still doing for us today. In fact, you know, he has promised us in that same way that he will bear us on eagle's wings. If you remember the promise of the Lord when it says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the earth, of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the young shall faint, and the youth shall faint, and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. On the basis of the care of God, on the basis of the provision of the Lord, on the basis of his protection, on the basis of what he had done for them, the Lord now called them to a solemn covenant. Come back to Exodus 19 verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now they came into a covenant with the Lord. Now this word covenant, let me just explain to you. There were two types of covenants. Now, there might be more types, but there were two prevailing kinds of covenant. One covenant was between two equals. A man and another man of equal strength, of equal possession, of equal privileges in society, making a covenant together. The second kind of covenant was a covenant between two people that were not equal, like a covenant between a king and the subjects or the citizens in the kingdom. Now, in the first kind of covenant, when two people of equal power, equal privilege, equal possession, equal position, when these two people, when they made a covenant together, what happened is that they came into this solemn agreement that they will not act independently of one another anymore. 
If anything, if you are to understand anything by a covenant, that is something you need to understand. That when two, of, when two people like that came together in a covenant relationship, that one will not be able to act independently of the other anymore. An illustration we can use today is a covenant of marriage, where a man and a woman come into a solemn covenant together. You see the man and the woman having the, both of them are human beings, so both of them are believers, and then they come into this covenant. And one thing that you notice in that covenant is that the husband cannot act independently of the wife anymore. And the wife cannot act independently of the husband because they come into a covenant relationship. But then the other kind of covenant, that is a covenant between two people that are not equal, like between a king and the subjects of the kingdom. This is similar to the covenant that God made at this time with the children of Israel. God, the ancient of days. God, the almighty. God, the sovereign. God, the king of kings and the lord of lords. He was making a covenant with the children of Israel, the people that were just taken out of the house of slavery and bondage. Now, in a covenant like that, it is the greater one that will set the conditions of the covenant and then upon the basis of a gift or a promise or something that the greater one will do for the less uh, for the younger one then he'll say the less or the younger should now be obedient he'll set the conditions and here is what the lord has done here the lord called them to a special covenant and then he set the condition the condition of obedience and faith. Look at verse 5 again. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed. That's the condition of the covenant. The Lord called the people to covenant and he said, The only way you can enjoy the privilege of the covenant, the benefits of the covenant, is that you will be obedient to the voice of the Lord indeed. Then he said, You will keep my covenant. That is, you'll keep the condition. You'll keep the terms. And then you'll be obedient to the commandments associated with the covenant of the Lord. Now he, tell, he told them the benefit that they will derive. He said, and then, ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. That these people be, will become a peculiar treasure. You know when you cherish something, and you are girding that thing, protecting that thing, and you are fond of that thing, and it is a peculiar treasure unto you. You'll find there some women, for example, it may be they have a particular bag. And they always go along with their bag. And everything that is precious, precious to them, they always put either in that basket or in that bag. That's like a peculiar treasure. Now, the Lord is saying, you will be a peculiar treasure unto him on condition that you'll be obedient to the voice of the Lord. Then in verse 6, he also said that there will be a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. You see, actually, the Lord wanted all the children of Israel to be a kingdom of priests unto him. Now, this covenant that the Lord made with the children of Israel, I told you, it made them a peculiar treasure in the sight of the Lord. The psalmist talks about that in Psalm 135. Psalm 135, reading from verse 4. For the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. You see that? The Lord has chosen Jacob, has chosen Israel for himself. He has made them his peculiar treasure. But then we want to ask the question, how about the Christian today? How about the people of God today? Are we any peculiar treasure unto the Lord, before the Lord? I want you to remember that in the case of the children of Israel, as you go on in their history, they lost that privileged position. Because they went into idol worship. The, the tribe of Judah uh, held on a little bit. But the northern kingdom went into idol worship. And the Lord rejected them. In fact, he sent prophets to them. He will disperse them. Eventually, the kingdom of Judah also. The house of David. 
that is uh, Judah and uh, Benjamin. They also went into idol worship. Eventually, Jeremiah and Ezekiel all prophesied, telling them they will go into captivity. He will hand them over unto the Babylonians, and there were no more peculiar treasure in the sight of the Lord because they did not fulfill the terms of the covenant. And now the Lord has come, has turned to the Gentiles. He has not turned to the church. And it is the church now that is a peculiar treasure of the Lord. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, reading to you from verse 14. And see what the Lord has done concerning the church, who gave himself for us, us the church, us the believers, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works peculiar people zealous of good works that's the position the lord has called us to even now then in first peter chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 5 ye also as lively stones have built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You see, God wanted to make Israel a kingdom of priests. But unfortunately, they did not fully follow the Lord. They did not continue from generation to generation to follow the teaching, the commandment of the Lord. And you see, that privilege of being a priestly royal nation was conditioned on obedience and faith in the Lord. And since they didn't continue in obedience and faith to the Lord, eventually they were rejected. And then the Lord turned to the Gentiles, to the church. But understand that we, that have been called into this peculiar relationship now, and holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord, it is also conditioned on our obedience and faith in the Lord. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people. Do you see that? A peculiar people. Today, we are the peculiar people of the Lord. And what's our responsibility? What's our duty? What's, what are we supposed to do? In that verse 9, it says that he should show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which means that the condition for us is that we will so live, we will let a light so shine, that people will see our good works and they glorify our Father, our God who is in heaven. And so the Lord called them to a peculiar situation, a peculiar relationship that will become a peculiar treasure unto the Lord. And we have been called into that situation today. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 19, reading from verse 7. Exodus 19 verse 7. And Moses came and, call, and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. Verse 8 is very important. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And, the, and Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Would God that these uh, children of Israel had followed after that solemn promise all, through all their generations, it would be a wonderful thing for them. But you see, this generation, they promised the Lord. They said, O oh Lord, everything you have said, everything you have commanded, all that the Lord has promised, we will do. All that he has spoken, we will do. And this ought to be our heart today, our desire today, our promise, our covenant, our vow today. Every time you hear the word of God, maybe on a Monday, maybe on a Thursday, or maybe on a Tuesday, or maybe on a Saturday, or maybe on a Sunday, or maybe you are just on your own. You hear the word of the Lord. You read the word, and it speaks to you, brings conviction unto you, and it tells you what thing to repent from. And it tells you what habit to stop and break in your life. And it tells you what duty you are to carry out. And the word of God tells you what way you are to walk in. Or it tells you what responsibility is laid upon you. Whether you are in the church, whether you are in the house fellowship, or whether you are alone by yourself. These ought to be your reaction, your response to the teaching of the word of God. All that the Lord has spoken we will do we will not be like the people that saved the word of god and you know there are some people that they will say i can't do that 
I won't do that. They'll pick and choose. They'll say, I will keep this one. I will not keep that one. I will do this. I will not do that. They do not fully yield to the Spirit of God. You see, we, we do not have blessings in our lives. When we do that, the way to blessing is the way of saying unto the Lord, All that you have spoken, we will do. And I want you to remember something. It wasn't that the Lord was all the time, every time speaking directly to them. He sent Moses to speak unto them. Oh yes, that's the reason he has given us apostle and prophet, evangelist, pastor and teacher. So that they can declare the mind of God unto us. Now in fact, he told the children of Israel very clearly. It wasn't that God himself was every time talking to them. There were times that he sent those prophets his servants and they declared the truth unto them. You see, the problem with some people is that they do not know the way of the Lord and they do not keep the way of the Lord. They will say, if God tells me by myself, if God convinces me himself, if God speaks to me directly, oh, but God has his own way. He has his own way of speaking to us. And when you hear the word of God, it may be that it's a little child. Or it may be house fellowship leader. Or it may be our coordinator. Or it may be that you are hearing directly from the pulpit as you are hearing now. As you are taught the word of God, then you will obey. It may be that that word of God is preceded by a wonderful music. Well, when that's available, that is good. Or it may be just in a counseling room. That just you and the counselor alone. And he opens the word of God unto you. And solemnly and quietly he declares the word of God unto you. You will obey the word of God. You wouldn't wait until you say, let God speak to me directly. He sends people to speak unto us. Let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Verse 23, but this thing I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways. You see that? We are not to pick and choose, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Now when he said, Obey my voice, what does that mean? What Did that mean that he was talking to them directly himself all the time? Verse 25, since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising daily, rising daily, rising up early and sending them. Rising up, sending them. You see, when you hear the word of God, it may be through the pastor, it may be through your coordinator, it may be through uh, even a fellow believer, just like yourself. Your attitude ought to be all that the Lord has spoken to us, we will do. We will be obedient. Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24, we're reading from verse 3 and verse 7. And Moses came. And told the people all the words of the Lord. Now you can see the faithfulness of Moses here. This ought to teach us faithfulness as preachers of the word of God. That you will not minimize the word of God. You will not keep part of the word of God back. Moses declared to them all the words of the Lord. And all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice. Beautiful thing. All the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Verse 7. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And he said, All that the Lord had said, we will do and be obedient. May the Lord give every one of us obedient hearts in Jesus' name. Now, we want to pass on to point number two. Point number two, which is holiness and discipline in the congregation. We now come to Exodus chapter 19 from verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee. 
and believe thee forever before I pass on. You see, it was a very great concern in the heart of the Almighty God that the people will believe the leader he has appointed. Because, you see, if you don't believe the leader that God has appointed, everything will collapse. And so God wanted the people to believe Moses and to believe that he had sent Moses and what, they, what Moses was telling them was exactly the word from the Lord. He said that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. That is the word that he had said, what the Lord has, brought, what the Lord has commanded, we will do. He, he brought back the vow, the consecration, the commitment of the people. He said, O oh Lord, this is what the people have said. The Lord hears all our consecration, all our utterances in making vow. When we tell him, O oh Lord, I will be obedient. O oh Lord, I will never rebel again. O oh Lord, reveal yourself to me. Show me wondrous things out of thy law. I will not be a hearer of the word alone. I will be a doer of the word. The Lord hears when we say that. Verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about saying, Take ye to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mountain, into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but it shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. It shall not lay. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes, and he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Now you can see here that God was uh, telling the children of Israel that he demanded holiness, sobriety, discipline. You see here, if you look at the passage very well, number one, it, God said, Moses, go down to the people, sanctify them. Then he said, in sanctifying them, this was an external kind of sanctification, which was a picture and a symbol of inward holiness, inward sanctification. Then he gave them the details that they will wash their clothes. And that they will be very careful in their relationship, even with their wives. Not only that, he said they will set bounds around the mountain. Because God was going to descend upon that mountain. And as God will descend upon the mountain, it will be a new sight, a new experience, something the children of Israel had never seen. Then God warned them. And he said, none will be presumptuous. None will have any kind of familiarity with the Almighty God that he will want to presumptuously, curiously go to that mountain to gaze upon the personality of the Almighty God. That none will do that, that if anyone will dare do that and not be sober and not be self-controlled and not be temperate and not be disciplined, then he said, the fiery indignation of God will come at such an individual. And the people will have to bring discipline upon such an individual. That that individual will be killed. Well, it meant that God demanded from the children of Israel a kind of life that will be holy and righteous. A kind of life that will be sober. A kind of life that will be temperate. A kind of life that will be self-disciplined. Then he told them, if they did not discipline themselves, then the congregation will have to discipline them severely. Will have to stone them for their presumption. Now, let us take these points one by one. And see what the Lord requires today. I want to go back to Exodus chapter 19. And I'm going to read to you from verse 10. In verse 10 it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes 
As I told you already, what God was telling them here was a kind of outward cleanliness. The people were now to prepare for God's holy presence upon the mount. They were to be clean, sanctified, and holy. Their preparation included external cleansing. But notice this, that was to be an outward symbol of inward holiness which God requires without which no man shall see the Lord. All the regulations given to the children of Israel here were to teach the people the necessity of holiness and the absolute obedience that God required from the children of God. Let's see in other parts of scripture. In Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11, reading to you from verse 44. Leviticus 11 verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves. And ye shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. What I want you to notice here is this. The Lord said, ye shall be holy, for I am holy. And then just to give them an instance or just to give them an illustration. Then he said, you will not defile yourself with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Actually, he was asking for total holiness. In what holiness? Public and private holiness. Holiness that was constant. Holiness that God himself appreciated. But he just gave them an illustration saying, You will not defile yourself with any creeping thing. That you will not defile yourself with any creeping thing was an external thing. But then, God actually required something inward. But understand this. Holiness is both inward and outward. You see, there are people that may deceive themselves and they will say, Well, they are holy. That you shouldn't look at their outward external behavior. A person might be chewing tobacco, taking a drug. A person might be uh, smoking and will say, well, don't look at what I do outwardly. You see, I'm holy inwardly. A person might slap his wife and beat his wife and get angry and be violent and say, well, uh, don't look at uh, uh, what I've done. Actually, in my heart, God knows my heart. Inwardly, I am holy. You know, there are people like that. There are some people that uh, they, will be, they will be drinking. And as they are drinking, you challenge them. Oh, they say everything is, it depends on what your heart is. I know my heart. I know my heart. My heart is holy. Holiness is something within. Although I drink, that doesn't mean that I am not holy. Can you see some uh, women that will have uh, worldliness all around? And you will see the pride of life. The loss of the eyes. And you will see all the worldliness when the word of God says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And you will see a lot of these people, they say, Oh no, don't look at the outward expression. After all, it, it is my heart that matters. Uh, what I put on, what I wear doesn't really matter. You know, it is like a, a madman that doesn't know that he's mad. And he doesn't have any shirt on, no trousers on, only has a pant and is running all around. And he say, come, come. Oh, he say, don't look at my outward appearance that I'm wearing pants alone in the open. He came to the office just wearing pants. They say, what is wrong? What is wrong? Oh, he said, nothing is wrong. My brain is correct. Being correct in brain is something inward. You don't look at the outward thing. Oh, they will take him to the psychiatry because they know. It is that outward expression shows that within something is wrong. You see, the Lord is calling us to holiness. And the holiness God is calling us to will be in what holiness that is also seen outwardly well there are many references you'll see that on your outline but let me read this to you in the new testament in first thessalonians chapter 4 first thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 7 for god has not called us unto uncleanness but unto holiness let us realize that he has not called us to fornication 
He has not called us to idol worship. He has not called us to eating things, sacrifice to idols. He has not called us to immorality. He has not called us to pornography. He has not called us to masturbation. He has not called us to any kind of dirty, immoral behavior. He has not called us into jesting either. He has not called us into anything that is uh, at least than the holy standard of the Almighty God. For God has not called us to uncleanness. What has he called us to? He has called us unto holiness. Holiness in heart, holiness in life. Holiness in attitude, holiness even in your appearance. Holiness in disposition. Holiness in the feeling, in the emotion. You show me a person that is, you know, violent and aggressive and tearing things apart and it's always a bully in the home. Can we call that holiness? No. The Lord is calling us into holiness. Holiness in the family circle. Holiness when the brothers are not there. Holiness everywhere. Holiness all the time. Then he said something in verse 8. He therefore that despises, despises not man. But God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Here is something that is very important. He says, when this word comes out, the word of holiness, the word of sanctification, the word of purity of heart and rectitude that is proper kind of living in conduct, there will be people that will despise. There will be people that say, well, that's their own. I don't accept that. I don't take that as part of my Christian life. They may emphasize that. They may say that. They may even read it from the Bible. I hear the preaching. I hear what they are saying. As for me, I don't accept that. Then it tells us, they will say, they believe in God. And they believe in the Spirit of God. They, but they don't take the pastor as they all in all. They know what they accept. They know what they reject. Now such people will pretend that they are still children of God. And they will say, we're not despising God. All that we're doing is that we, we don't agree with her brother so and so whenever he emphasizes that part of the word of God. Look at verse 8. It says, he therefore that despises, you despise the teaching on holiness. You despise the practice of holiness and sanctification. It says, he therefore that despises, despises not man. But God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Now the people that despise, how do we know them? Oh, we know them by their character, by their behavior. And that is what the Lord told the children of Israel. He said, Moses, you go and tell them. And tell them they should not be curious, they should not be presumptuous. To come to the mountain to gaze at the Almighty God. Or to touch the mountain. If they did, then they are despising my word. And then there will be discipline. You hear that? There will be discipline. Now, the discipline for these children of Israel, if they touched the mouth, will be disciplined by stoning, stoning them to death. Now, that may surprise you. But I want to show you something that in the Old Testament, touching that mountain, being curious and presumptuous in wanting to gaze at the Lord, that wasn't the only sin that merited death punishment or death penalty. There were some other sins. Let me just show you a few of them. There are so many of them in Scripture, but we'll show a few. Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, reading to you from verse 1 and verse 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel. Can you see that? Whosoever, whosoever. There is no respect of persons with the Lord. A person cannot say, I'm the high priest, I'm the priest, I'm a Levite, I'm a special individual, I'm a relative of Moses. I am an old, elderly, ancient one. No. It says, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, of the strangers that sojourn in Israel. That is the people that will say, Well, we're not really fully part of Israel. We're just fellowshipping with them. I don't claim deeper life fully to be my church. I'm just here to fellowship. And therefore, I can do whatever I like. No, you cannot do whatever you like. Whether you claim to be a member or not, once you associate with the people of God, your fellowship with the people of God, you will be bound by the same law, by the same word of God. Then he says, of the stranger that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed, his children, unto Molech. 
it shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. That is, if anyone will offer his child to idol, if anyone will offer his child to evil and sacrifice that child to uh, for a god, a foreign god, an idol, a strange god, that that individual will be killed. Not only that, verse 6. And a soul that so turneth after such as are familiar spirits and after wizards to go and warning after them. I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. You see, that's another thing. It's telling us here that those who go into witchcraft, into sorcery, into magic, into occultism, or into any kind of uh, dark power, that these people, they merit discipline. And the discipline among the children of Israel was death, death penalty. Do you see all this was in the context of sanctification? In the context of holiness. In fact, look at the next verse in verse 7. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy for I the Lord. For I am the Lord your God. And it says, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. And immediately he spoke about sanctification. He also spoke about discipline. Look at verse 9. And everyone that causeth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. You cannot separate holiness from discipline. Any child that teaches holiness must also maintain discipline. Look at verse 10. And the man that committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be surely shall be put to death. Now you ask the question, here is the New Testament time. Somebody commits adultery, or somebody is known to have witchcraft, or somebody is known to kill, to destroy another person's life, or somebody is known to commit abortion, destroy innocent life, or somebody is known to go from house to house, from zone to zone, from district to district, uh, making young ladies pregnant. Or somebody is known to be defrauding, saying, I have a bank, I am a financial house, and I'm getting this. If I get uh, 5000 from you in three months, I'll give you 8000 And it's duping people. If we know things are going on like that, in the Old Testament, they'll be stoned. What do we do in the New Testament? Is there any kind of discipline at all in the New Testament? Let's come on to the New Testament. In First Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Now, what were they to do? Even though they couldn't kill this individual, what were they to do as a church standing for righteousness and holiness of life? Verse 4 and verse 5. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even when ye are gathered together, not privately, not that uh, the leader will call the fellow privately and say, you see, uh, this is uh, fornication with your father's wife. Uh, your father lost uh, your mother, and your mother has died, and your father married again after the death of your father. And now we hear that you are committing fornication. What is this kind of thing? You know how much we love you in this, our church. And we don't want to lose your fellowship at all. And we don't want people to hear this. Because if they hear now, I about your, res your self-respect, and you're not, nothing like that. It says, look at this, when ye are gathered together, that is publicly in the congregation, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now you can see here, it was to be a public kind of discipline because of the immorality. Not only that, they were to excommunicate and they were to cast out that individual, remove him from the protection of the church, from the prayer power of the church, from the light in the church, and throw him out and throw him into the hands of Satan. Well, you say, how will he hear the word of God? Here is the word of God. Here is the word of God. 
And those of you think that we are being kind, we are being gentle, and then we are changing and twisting the word of God. And we cannot stand firmly on those, says the Lord. You see, the judgment will come upon those sinners and also come upon you. It says to deliver such and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What does it mean, the destruction of the flesh? Do you remember that prodigal son? The flesh was being destroyed with hunger, with thirst, with need. And then that was what made him came, come back to himself. And then he said, he came back to himself and he said, I will return to my father. And when he returns like that, his soul will be saved. In 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 from verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning the faith, concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And then he gives two examples. And then he, he said what he did to bring discipline upon them. Of whom is Imanius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan. He's saying the protection of the church is no more upon them. They are excommunicated. They are sent out of the fellowship of the people of God. Not only that, they are now thrown into the hands of the devil so that their body will be punished. And at that time, they will not be able to claim the promises of God because they are not standing on covenant ground. This is the word of God. We have to stand by the word of God. It says, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. You see, these people were teaching false doctrine. They were blaspheming. They were contradicting the sound doctrine of salvation, of holiness, of the power of the Holy Ghost, of the faith that we need to have in God. And they were making the shipwreck not only of their own faith, of the faith of others. Because of that, discipline came upon them. They were sent out from the community of the believing people, of the children of God. In fact, there are so many references in the New Testament that you will see that the word of God has told us how to act and what to do. When you find that people are not walking straight and they are not living according to the word of God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, open your Bible. Don't turn off the word of God just because it's talking about church discipline. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. Now we command you. This is not an advice. It's a command. We're not pleading with you. Would you please do this? A leader in the church. This is a command. Now we command you. And we brethren, children of God. This is a command to the old church. Brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves. From every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us, that you withdraw yourself, that you withdraw the that uh, fellowship you're having in that house, you withdraw it if that fellow is a drunkard. If that fellow is going from district to district and uh, making a young lady so be pregnant or committing immorality, if that fellow is uh, going from place to place and is uh, twisting the word of God and is overthrowing the faith of the people, if that fellow is going about with, uh, I have a dream, I have a vision, you will marry so and so, that you will withdraw from such an individual where to stand by the word of God. The people that are living in sin, you find a, a man that is in our midst. And he'll go to this one and get a 5,000 naira. Go to that one, get 3,000 naira. Go to, and right now, he might be having 40,000, 50,000. And uh, people are saying, well, it's our member. You see your member? You see a child of God, a person that is uh, fraudulent like that, going about and stealing. And then we, we say, well, you know, it's one of us. No, it's not one of us. That you withdraw yourself. That you will withdraw the house fellowship from his house. That you will withdraw the night vigil or whatever else you are having from his house. That you will not have any fellowship with such an individual so that he will be ashamed. And when you see him outside, you make him to know that we are children of God and we stand for righteousness and holiness. You find a person that says he's a child of God. He's been with us. And then he goes to marry unbeliever. Now we withdraw ourselves from such people. Or a person that says that is one of us, he goes to marry his second wife. 
or a lady that says she's a child of she's a child of God and then goes to marry an unbeliever or goes to be a second wife somewhere. We have nothing to do with such an individual in First Corinthians chapter five again. First Corinthians chapter five from verse eleven. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, not to have fellowship. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one, no, not to eat. You see how serious the word of God is? You see how serious it is? It says, no, not even to eat with him. In verse 13, but them that are without, God judges. Those sinners that are outside, their judgment is in the hand of God. But those that are inside, if they are living unrighteous lives, look at the latter part of verse 13. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. That wicked person. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 20. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all. That others also may fear. And you know, there are some people that have forgotten the standard of the Bible. And they'll go around, they will say, well, uh, you know, really, my problem is that I believe the Bible. I accept holiness. My problem is that, you know, some of these coordinators, they just put on us here. Uh, if, you, if you committed sin, see, uh, that uh, person that committed adultery, that person that committed fornication, why didn't they call the person privately and just talk about it privately? Why did they have to talk about it openly? Here is the word of God. We want to be very careful. We are not destroying the word of God. We are not taking away from the word of God. Look at verse 20. We can read. There is no big grammar there. There is no English language here that is so difficult to understand. What word is too big here that you cannot understand? Look at it in verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all publicly in the congregation, not privately. It says that others also may fear. The word of God is simple and straightforward. All we have to do is to be obedient to the word of God. Titus chapter 1 verse 13. Titus chapter 1 verse 13. This witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply. Uh, you know, they will say, do you think that coordinator is sanctified the way he rebuked that individual? Because I think that the way he was rebuked, what if the person has, uh, has become pregnant without uh, being married? What if the person has committed fornication? What if the person has duped other people and he has uh, got thousands of naira from other people and he cheated them? What if the man said he has a house and he says he's a member and he has got money from many of her members and we discovered later that he didn't have a house. He didn't have any house to rent out. Is that the reason why they look at the way the coordinator spoke about it or that zona leader spoke about it you tell me don't you think that was sharp oh yes i think it was sharp and i think it ought to be sharp i even think it wasn't sharp enough look at that in verse 13 wherefore rebuke them sharply you cannot be rebuking sin and laughing you cannot be rebuking sin and jesting you cannot be rebuking sin and putting your arms around them you cannot be rebuking sin and, and uh, saying, well, uh, I just want to tell you, it is not that this fellow is the greatest sinner. He is one of our beloved brothers. But I just want to tell you, the devil deceived. No, that's no rebuke. You are justifying his sin. Rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. If this church is going to remain sound, we have to maintain scriptural discipline. In fact, God, according to the passages I've read to you, still maintains discipline in his church. Those who claim to belong to God cannot live in lawlessness. To uphold holiness in the church, scriptural discipline must be maintained. And you see all these references in the word of God. You see the church without the rod of correction. The church without the rod of discipline will eventually be defiled, deceived, destroyed, and finally will be abandoned by God. I pray that this church will stand on the watch of God and we will not joke, we will not play with the word of God. Where sin has to be rebuked, we rebuke sin. 
where sinners are to be corrected, we correct the sinners. And where some of our believers and some of our brothers and sisters, they might have been very, very useful, dependable in the church before. If they go into sin and they are going to pollute the whole church, of course we love them. In fact, it is the person you love you are going to chastise. And this is why the word of God says, rebuke them sharply so that they will fear and so that other people too will learn their lessons so they will not go, they will not continue in sin to defile and to destroy the whole church. Let's now come to the last point and this is quite brief. This is talking about the majestic presence of God upon the mount. Majestic presence of God upon the mount. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day, in the morning, that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and a voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp, that uh, was in the camp, trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God. And he stood at the neither part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as a smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon the Mount Sinai, on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. It was a terrifying sight. God made his presence known, and when he did, all the people trembled. In fact, we're told in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 21, that Moses himself was made to tremble with fear at the side. Well, why the whole experience here? Here is it. The whole experience was designed to create a true fear of God in the people and to prepare them to respect the law of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Hebrews reminds us that we're living in a more serious time. In this day of grace, because, you see, it, this is more than the time of the children of Israel. And we should realize that the scripture has told us very clearly. Let us see where the New Testament makes use of this passage. In Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're looking at it from verse 22. Hebrews 12 verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. It's making a difference, or it's making a comparison, a contrast between Mount Zion and Mount Sinai. In the previous verse, verse 21, And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, even the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Now, what lesson will the, will the Lord have us learn here? Now, you know that we're in the age of grace. And I tell you that there are some people that do not understand the Bible. And they say that, well, you know, we're in the age of grace. All these things we're studying from the New Testament, uh, we don't need to study them. We just need to remember the love of God and the grace of God. You see, some of these people, they are some of the people that are so fond of calling God Papa, Daddy. They will say, Papa in heaven. They will say, Our Daddy in heaven. Whenever they talk like that, they have the erroneous view that God always will always treat them like fragile, little, weak babies. If they do anything wrong, they will say, Papa. They will say, Daddy. You know, God is not interested in that kind of language. They speak much of His love and tender care without realizing that he demands obedience and holiness from all his people. In fact, they have a distorted understanding of what they call the dispensation of grace and love. They rule out any kind of fear for God. They claim to be so familiar with God that they think there is nothing to fear. But let us hear the New Testament. The New Testament grace that we know about does not lead to such careless attitude. 
or antinomian behavior. Antinomian behavior means a kind of conduct or behavior that acts as if there is no judgment at all. Look at this passage, for example. It says in verse 25, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not, who refuse him that speak that speak on earth, much more, much more, shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Do you see what he's saying here? He said, Moses came to the people, and he spoke unto the people, Don't touch the mountain. If you touch the mountain, you'll be stoned to death. He said, If they didn't escape, the punishment, the discipline, the fall indignation of God. When they refused him that spoke on earth, then he said, How much more shall we not escape? We in the New Testament, we were in the age of grace. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice, verse 26, then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made. That those things which cannot be shaken may remain. This is the counsel he has for the New Testament believers, verses 28 and, verse two, and 29. Wherefore, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Not with carelessness, not with sin, not with immorality, with reverence and godly fear. Then it says, for our God. Notice that he didn't say their God. He didn't say the God of the Old Testament. He says our God. The God we're serving even now is a consuming fire. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31. Hebrews 10, verse 31, and he's talking to New Testament believers. It says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see the point of scripture, you see the teaching of scripture, is that even those of us in this age of grace, that we are not to become so familiar with God to the point that our worship will insult God. That our lives will be careless. That we will forget that even in the New Testament, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. You see, the Lord has revealed this, the depths of his heart, the revelation of his word unto us today. And we did pray at the beginning that the Lord will remove the scales out of our eyes, the ignorance and the darkness out of our being, that we'll be able to understand him. I'm sure you have heard the voice of the Lord. I'm sure you have heard the word of the Lord. We come to the awe-inspiring presence of God right now. And what, what do you want to do? Wouldn't you want to come before the Lord and make a solemn covenant before the Lord? Wouldn't you like to be a peculiar treasure in the sight of the Lord? Wouldn't you want to tell the Lord if there's anything to repent of, if there is anything to correct in your life, if there is anything to lay upon the altar, if there is anything to cleanse by the blood of Jesus Christ, wouldn't you want to rise up and say, Oh Lord, cleanse me. Oh Lord, cleanse me. I don't want evil. I don't want iniquity. I don't want any trespass. I don't want any sin in my life. Cleanse me and make me pure and whiter than snow. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, help me. If you discipline yourself, the church will not have to discipline you. If there is self-discipline, if you are under the discipline of the Spirit of God and you live your life, a sober life, a correct life, a scriptural life, nobody will have to make any announcement about you. If you will walk circumspectly, Perfectly in the house of God and you will live according to the word of God. We'll enjoy fellowship together. Let there be holiness in the house of God. Holiness become in thy house, O Lord, forever. We're now, we're now before the majestic presence of the Almighty God. Let us come before the Lord and let us ask him for grace whereby we can serve him with reverence and godly fear. Call upon the Lord. The mercy of God is still available. If you have sinned, if you truly repent, he will forgive you. If you have offended your fellow brother, your fellow sister, go back and apologize to them. And make right your way. And let the fellowship of the people of God be clean, righteous, and holy. A leader, a coordinator will continue leading us in prayer. We really need to pray. Coordinator, lead us and lead according to this word of God. Let there be holiness. Let there be purity in the church of the living God. Stay through and let us really pray tonight.